Greetings, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me for Straight Talk with Jonna Houston. Now, that means straight up talk, no chaser, right? Truth and transparency. And today we're going to roundtable discuss topics like systematic racism, uh, racial equity, diversity, inclusivity. And we're going to also talk about the premiere of a powerful web series named Taj and how it talks and speaks to all of these topics. People might say after the events of the last 15 months or as of the taping of this program, the last two weeks, well, that social justice, racial this and that and the other. I mean, are we still talking about that stuff? Haven't we talked about it enough? No. And we will talk about today why that is true. You see, we're not out of the woods just because of one verdict by a very attentive and courageous jury. We have with us today a very well-informed panel of special guests who will share their thoughts, their backgrounds, their experiences in activism along these lines. And they will definitely give you more than a few things to ponder, to pray over, and to think about long after this program has ended. Our guests include the three executive producers, the creator, writer, and director, and the amazing young actor who brings the role of Taj to life. You won't want to miss this. So I invite you to leave your comments, like and share with others as often as you like, and we hope that you will. And with that, let's get our conversation started. I wanna introduce you to our first guest. Her name is Ms. Donna Trumbo. She's a former newscaster for ABC. She's been a church director, a church administrator, a pastor, and she definitely has diversity as the main heartthrob of what she does in her everyday life. So I'd like to ask you first, Donna, to get us started. You explained that your life mission is driven by the scripture Micah 6, 8. Now, I'm very well aware, I, I know that scripture very well. Could you share with our audience though, what it means to you and why it's so special to you? Thank you, Jonna, and thank you for having us on the show. Micah 6, 8 is my mantra. I think about it daily, I pray about it daily, and it is this, what does the Lord require of you to do? To seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Well, let's go backwards with that scripture verse. Um, first of all, I've got to walk humbly with my God. So anything that I do must be in great humiliation. I must have the right spirit to do it, the right spirit to see it and to follow through, knowing that my actions mean nothing. It's what I do as a vessel for God. And then let's talk about mercy. I want to think about mercy every day because with mercy brings compassion. It brings the let's go of ego and pride, and to learn to really have empathy and love for others. And the final one is to seek justice, which I think that I was born with my whole life. I, my mom says I'm the Mulan of the family who carries on the flag and the, wears the shield and says, I'm going as a warrior out there um, because it's not about me. It's for my love for others. And I think that's why that scripture verse is so important to me. Now, Donna, you are Chinese American, correct? All right. And you had a best friend in third grade. Now, most of us know that, you know, the first best friend that we ever had in life came around third or fourth, second or third grade, actually. Um, she was white. She was your first white friend. What was the relationship like and how did it frame or impact your own self-image? This is such a beautiful story and one that I will never forget. Her name is Darlene Pete. I met her in third grade. She was my first white person who looked at me as a person. She never said anything about what color are you or where are you from? She just accepted me for who I was. And I think what made Darlene so important in my life is because she was so much better than I was in everything, in academics, in sports, everything that, that I wanted to be. She was better than me, but I wasn't jealous about it. 
because I was always feeling lesser as a person of color. She made me feel encouraged. You, I can do it. She'd always say, you can do it, Donna, just keep going. One day I will never forget, Donna, because we were at recess and she was the tetherball queen of third grade. She always beat everybody. But that particular day at recess, I know what she did. She chose to let me win because it encouraged me. It encouraged me to continue on and to lead and be proud of who I am and keep going strong. To this day, you know, we're still friends even though we're moved far away. But I often think about that time. It changed my life and the trajectory of my life as well. Joanna, you are one of the co-executive producers of Taj, along with Donna Trumbo. Professionally, you're involved in leadership, life coaching, uh, racial equity activism. Let me ask you, you were born in Jacksonville, Texas. You attended and graduated from UT, <laughs> University of Texas in Austin, right? What, if any, awareness did you have during those formative years of yours about systemic racism, if anything? Oh, yes, I can tell you many stories. And uh, before I go on, Jonna, thank you so much for having us on the show. It means a lot for the community to support what we're doing. So, uh, yes, have stories to tell. The one that sticks out, especially growing up in Jacksonville, we had a store. It was called J.B. White's. Every person of color in town knew if you went to that store, you were going to be followed around by the sales clerks. Literally, the minute you walked in the store, they would follow you around and they would just stand next to you. They never asked if they could help you. They just mm -hmm. stood there next to you. And if you asked them why, they just kind of looked at you and shrugged. Mm -hmm. It was small town, so there were very few stores at which we could shop. In that one, we knew every person of color told the stories. Um, did we have other options? Very limited, very mm -hmm. limited, but we shopped there. We did at the time um, because out of necessity, uh, use our dollars there. So I remember growing up um, with that uh, mm -hmm. description of systemic racism. And I remember when I was at the University of Texas, we had a class that talked about racism, discrimination and prejudice and leaving the class, the students, the white students, the Caucasians uh, were very vocal about how they were tired of hearing about racism, how they were tired mm -hmm. of hearing about discrimination, how it wasn't their fault um, and we should just get over it. I was walking by myself and all I could do was just listen. Mm -hmm. I felt alone. But I also knew it was an important story. And I also knew I had not heard, I had also heard those things before. Uh, it was a large institution, grateful to be there, knew I had earned my way. Mm -hmm. uh, but also that told the tale of the, the systemic racism that was continuing in our country. As a big sister, Twana, of two brothers, both serving in the military, both married, how has their lives as African-American young men in America fueled your racial equity activism? Uh, John, the most recent experience is with this pandemic when we knew that in order to uh, combat the, the coronavirus, mm -hmm. CDC guidelines said that we should wear masks. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine how distraught I was when I knew that my brothers were going to have to wear masks so they would not be seen as someone who was protecting themselves, but, but could be identified as someone who was a threat. That's right. right. They were wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. I sent them both messages and said, I need for you guys to be careful. I need you to be aware that yes, protect yourself, wear that mask, but do whatever you need to do to make sure that you are not a threat. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. The, the idea that they could be mistaken for a threat is easy. We see it played out on TV. We see it played out in our communities all the time. So that shaped my uh, world with continuing to, to do the advocacy because I knew at any moment I could get a call that my, oh brother, my, yes. Yes. my brothers could have been mistaken yes. for a threat because he was wearing a mask. And now Herman Johnson, 
the third member of the trio of ABC Equity Consultants. Your background includes uh, real estate, strategic planning, um, residential counseling for the job core, leadership development, things like that. Yes, yes, yes. So I wanted to ask you this. When you and your 12 year old son chat about the things of life and being a young black man in America, what kinds of things do you share with him? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, John, for having us on. We really appreciate it. Um, this topic is very important um, to all of us. But yeah, well, as far as my 12 year old son and I, we have these discussions a lot. Um, and we talk about it, I try to talk about it um, from a perspective of, you know, as a black man, we're going to have to work harder. It's just the way it is. It's okay. It's just, you know, I, I tell them it's like a race in life. Um, and imagine being on a track and the track is staggered. Um, and, it, you know, you're in the back, right? but mm -hmm. you got to still run the race. Like, it doesn't matter what position you start in. We, our goal is to create, you know, you just got to keep moving. And, and I think you, you're not at a dis disadvantage. You're not at you're where you are. And this is the boat we're in. We have to paddle. Uh, essentially, that's what I tell them. Uh, and, I, and I don't I don't hold anything um, back. I, if he asks questions, I like to tell him. And there's things that pop up in the media. I let him know what it is. But our foundation is in God. Um, that's where we put our foundation. You know, and so I tell him, like, <clears throat> in, in life, um, I'm big on Philippians 4.13. Um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I tell my son the same thing. And that's kind of how we move through life. I don't look for crutches or hindrances. I look for ways to overcome. Uh, and that's just, I try to instill that in my child and both my kids. And I think that is important. Um, but I do let them know that be appreciative to where they're at because they do have certain advantages that other kids don't have. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's kind of my position for my children. I like them to be humble um, and understand where they come from. And it's, you know, they're in a good position. You're a girl dad, right, Herman? <laughs> yeah, you are. So what is the most special part about watching your young daughter grow up? Oh, my gosh, I love it. Um, my daughter, <laughs> she's so much like her dad. So it's funny to watch her grow up. Um, so smart, so intelligent. Um, but she carries a lot of my characteristics just from a female. And it's so fun to watch her grow. And I see the things that, <laughs> that I did as a child and she does to me. And I, I, I love it. I think it's funny to watch my child challenge me in certain ways. Um, and, you know, it just, it's just so fun to watch and, and watch them overcome certain challenges where she couldn't swim. And me working with her and working with her, she has this mentality of, Dad, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna figure this out no matter what. And she won't quit. And if I pull her out the pool before she learns how to swim, she starts crying, right? And so I have to, I have to be able to, to you know, have to have that conversation. But I was the same kid, and so it's, it's tough. <laughs> and I love watching that, um, you know, for my daughter. She just, she's a go getter, and you not telling her she can't do something, she is gonna do it no matter what. And I just love that about my daughter. And she's. You know, she wants the dad's appreciation and dad's kudos at all times. And I just that, you know, uh, I love that. That's just fun to raise my daughter. I'm looking forward myself to watching her grow up <laughs> after you share that with us. I appreciate you all introduction, introducing yourselves in such a personal way and letting us uh, get to know you a little bit. We're going to take a little break right now, take a pause. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. And we're going to talk a little bit about your organization, your company, and what brought you into the partnership or what the working relationship on Taj with its creator, writer, director, Mr. Wanye Leonard, and with our fabulous lead actor, Mr. Grant Hall. They will be coming in in our third segment, and we're going to learn all about Taj, the web series. It's a powerful, powerful, very insightful and transformative project that you all have brought to the screen for the audience. And I can't wait to get to talk to the two of them as well about that series and what we need to know before it premieres probably in just a few weeks. So we'll take a break right now. You guys can mute yourself or take yourselves off video if you would like for a moment and we'll be right back.
Hi, welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Jonna Houston. And today we are talking about the topics of systemic racism, social injustice, and we are going to introduce you to the upcoming web series, Taj. At the end of our segment that we're in right now, we're going to introduce you to the creator, writer, director, Mr. Wanye Leonard, and our lead actor who plays Taj in the series, Grant Hall. But right now, I want to talk a little bit more to our executive producers, Ms. Tawana Armstrong, Ms. Donna Trumbo, and Mr. Herman Johnson. We got to know them a little bit personally in our first segment, but now I wanted to ask them a little bit about more about their passion, about their cause, and about their company, their partnership, ABC Equity Consultants. And I think I want to start with you, Herman. How's that? We hear the, the term systematic racism, um, racial equity, diversity, equity, inclusivity being used quite a bit of times, especially over this last year or two. If you could each say in a few words about them, because Taj, the web series, which we'll talk about a little later, is a powerful tool of enlightenment and truth about these words. What do you think? What do these words really mean? And how does Taj try to really define and enlighten these words for the people who are gonna see this series? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, John. Um, and I'd like to speak to that in you know, the arena I came from in the arena of education. Um, there's a lot of things that are systemically placed as obstacles in front of students uh, a lot of times. And, you know, and I think a lot of a lot of people don't recognize them. Um, and for example, there's some things that I've identified in my walk. Um, and what I've seen is just in high schools, for example, you have certain schools who will graduate students who are ill prepared for you know the real world, um, but they tend to have the same degree or diploma as other kids who are very prepared. Mm -hmm. um, case in point, I, I've done a research study on two different schools here in the Sacramento area. Um, and what I've identified was one school was in a more affluent neighborhood. Uh, and I interviewed teachers and students alike. And one, one school was in um, an underserved or marginalized area. Um, I got a chance to interview both parties, kids and students um, and teachers and counselors. And what I found was the counselors at the school who were in the affluent neighborhoods, they don't speak to the children. They don't have a lot of conversation. It's not necessarily needed. Um, you know, we think that the funding plays a role, but we, in reality, a lot of times the student, the schools in the underserved community gets, they get more funding than the more affluent schools. Mm -hmm. So I was perplexed in a, in a sense, because I didn't know like, what, what, what's going on. How come these kids seem to do better after high school than the other kids? And, and what I saw was that um, all education is not created equal. Hmm. Um, and, and what I mean by that is the graduation, the, the, the graduation rate at the lower, the lower socioeconomic school uh, was higher actually than the school at the more affluent school. And, and I just, all these things didn't add up to me. Um, so the more I investigated, what I realized is that the underserved school pushes kids through. They're gonna graduate. I don't care if you learn how to read, if you don't learn how to write, I, I, we got you got to get out of here. You got to leave this school. The, the kid at this, this, the students at the more affluent school, they tended to do better because they were held accountable. Um, they were, there was an accountability piece where in, a, in itself, it's not systemically wrong, but if you start looking at it, it happens time and time again. Mm -hmm. And so what you're doing is you're creating a cycle of inequality. That's true. It may be in, unintentional on, on, like on the surface, but as you dig in, you start to find there's, there's a socioeconomic component there. And what you're telling me is my parents don't have money. I'm not going to receive a good education. If I don't get a good education, it then turns into my, it limits my opportunity for, our, for work. And mm -hmm. then that, that limits my opportunity for income. Now I can't live in better neighborhoods. And it just, it's a cycle. And that's the systemic piece I was looking at um, as far as education wise. And so that's what really kind of prompted me to dig in more. And what, what else is like this? If I'm noticing this in this environment, what else is like this? And, and, and as the state goes, we say, well, you know what? The lower socioeconomic school receive more funding. They have a higher headcount, but they don't account for, for donations from the parents. Mm 
the donations from the alumni. And that plays a huge factor when it comes to how much resources the school has. And so those are things that I've been looking at. And when we talk about systemic, those are things that that's just one example of what I've uncovered in my, my walk and my experience. Well, I thank you for sharing that because those are things that a lot of people aren't privy to that information. They don't know what's really happening you know, behind the scenes, especially for the schools that you were talking about and where their children are, are going and how they might be able to help contribute or at least have you know, a stronger and more consistent voice in what's going on with it, the schools that their kids are attending. Absolutely. Um, I wanna ask you, Tawana, how did ABC Equity Consultants come into being? Oh, uh, we love to tell the story. So probably about three years ago, um, there was a racial healing project that held conversations about racism prejudice within our community. We all happened to be at one of those sessions and we gravitated towards one another, realized we had a lot in common, common decided that we wanted to pursue teaching, facilitating those conversations. We uh, embarked upon that, received the training, found ourselves facilitating training together a lot, found ourselves at several community events a lot, and we decided, I think we have something here. Let's right. get together, form our own company here, um, write a curriculum, if you will, that's going to showcase what we bring to the table when it comes down to facilitation, facilitation and teaching of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, ABC Equity Consultants was born. Wow, that's a great story. Great minds do think alike, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> well, then, Donna, um, you're a partner also in ABC Equity Consultants. How did your idea about bringing a project like Taj um, into your curriculum as another resource for racial healing and understanding, how, how did that happen? It was an accident, to be honest with you. Okay, a good one. Uh, we were four, it was a great one. Um, as we were coming together and working on an or, the, our nonprofit organization, I had heard about a story in which uh, Herman had contacted me and we discussed and said, you know, this is an interesting story that talks about systemic racism and how do we bring it upon the table? And so I said, I have a friend, his name is Wanya Leonard, an amazing writer, uh, director and producer. I need to share this with him. I think that there's a story about this that we could do. From there, um, we started talking about it. The, the actual production of that one didn't, didn't go as what we wanted and had hoped for uh, because timing wasn't good. It's still a wonderful story. But then came this idea. I said, you know, that's funny. We are doing uh, curriculum right now, and we could sure use our own videos to help us out. Uh, with the help of YouTube and other resources, we've been able to supply ourselves with the resources needed for our curriculum, but we really wanted something of our own. And so I said, hey, Wanye, how do you feel about helping us do some type of a series, educational series or a production that could help us work in curriculum in conjunction with our curriculum? And there sprouted Taj. And the rest is about to be history, right? The rest is history. <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a, and an impactful history at that. Absolutely. But what I'd like to do is to thank you so much for sharing that. And, and now we know how Taj came into being. So we're going to take a couple of minutes this time to take a little break and pause. And then in our next segment, we will introduce all of you to the writer, creator, and director of Taj, Mr. Wanye Leonard, and to the actor who has the lead role as Taj, actor Grant Hall. We'll be right back.
we are talking about systemic racism, we are talking about social justice, we're talking about diversity, equality, inclusivity, all those terms that people have heard a lot, especially over the last couple of years. And people are saying, well, why do we have to talk about that? Are we still talking about that? What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything to me, but it means something to all of us. And so now we're going to enter a part of our discussion where we have as our guests, writer, creator, and director of Taj, the web series, Mr. Wanye Leonard, and our lead actor who plays the role brilliantly of Taj, and that is Grant Hall. But before we get to the two of them, our, our director here, our tech director, he's been in the background for most of the show. And I wanted to give him the opportunity to share a couple of things that he wanted to share with everyone because he grew up in the South. He was born in Bristol, Virginia, and then you cross the street and you're in Bristol, Tennessee. He graduated from Hampton University in Virginia. We're still in the South. And he grew up during a time of segregation. The things that sometimes you see only in movies and that people believe, oh, it couldn't be true. It couldn't be as bad as all that, but it was. And he saw it up close and personal. So I uh, turn it over to him so that he can share with you a couple of thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for dating me incredibly by saying I grew up in segregation. <laughs> so don't, you don't have to do the math. Yes, we are talking about the 50s. <laughs> yes, I am that old. Okay, thank you, Donna. Um, um, first thing that, that is so amazing to me is I think what the murder of George Floyd did was wake people up to realize the beast had never died about racism. Uh, people thought, well, it can't be that bad. But when you watch somebody murdered for nine minutes on camera and you say, oh, that's what you guys are talking about. It's been going the whole time. And what made me feel like I went back in time because I, up in my fifth grade in Tennessee, segregation took place in my fifth grade. So I didn't even understand what segregation was doing when I went to the movies on Saturday and realized that was the only day I could go to the movies on Saturday. I didn't realize that was my reality. I didn't realize that I had to sit in the balcony. I wouldn't, I thought my mother was choosing to sit in the balcony. Not that I had to sit in the balcony. So these were things that were going on in the 50s and 60s where systemic racism was so ingrained, you didn't even question it. It was just, you don't sit in the balcony. You only sit in the balcony. You only go to movies on Saturday. Uh, you don't go here, you don't go there. And as a young person in, in uh, five, six years old, that was a reality. So I didn't even know there was a choice of, oh, this is not right. So systemic racism has been ingrained so many centuries that it's become a norm. And if you're born into it, you don't even know there is a choice. And so I think what has happened as we got into the 70s, uh, Black student unions, Black history classes, you suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, my legacy is not slavery. My le legacy is coming from kings and queens. If you're born into slavery, and that's your reality, you think your past is slavery. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know that you came from kings and queens. So you coming into thinking you're supposed to be a slave, supposed to be subservient, cause that's all you've ever known. So I think the biggest advancement was when we had black history classes, black student unions to make you aware, of course, in the society called that militant, they called that communist back in the sixties, to know the truth, you were being called a communist because you're telling our people, this is where you really came from. It wasn't being communist. It's telling your people who you really are. And so all of a sudden, when I was in college at Hampton, I said, man, I feel like I've been asleep all my life. We've done all this in history? In high school, all you ever heard of was Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Booker T. Washington. And you thought only three Black people did something in history. And I'll never forget, um, about 10 years ago, I went to this garage sale, and I found this, I found this book called... Um, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing, Black Contributions. This book was 2,000 pages. It was this thick, about, about this thick. And nothing but Black contributions from the mid 1500s to the 1950s. And it was for $2. Now that shows you the value the person thought selling it. A 2,000 page book about Black contribution is being sold for $2. I was amazed. But when I went to school, I was a substitute teacher all these years. I want to show people in Black History Month, let me show you what Black people have done. I just held the book up. They said, wow, 
2,000 pages? I say, yes, there's more than three people in history that have done something. So I think things like that, as we've gotten older of, of classes and um, programming that shows contributions of black people in history has made us more aware of who we are, which is now why the mentality of who we are now is much stronger than the 50s. The difference is we now know who we are and now we express ourselves knowing who we are. In the 50s, you didn't know who you were. So you accepted subservient, you, you accepted inferiority mm -hmm. because that was your reality. But when you got older, you learned about, wait a minute, I came from here, I came from there, that's who I really am? Wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be treated like that. And so when we saw the murder of George Floyd, that opened up for the other cultures, the thing we've been talking about for decades about in, in inferiority and police brutality. It wasn't anything new for us, but for the country, they thought we were just complaining. But then when the country saw a murder, a murder on camera for nine minutes, someone calling for their life, that's why the entire world protested. Cause all of a sudden they realized what we've been saying for decades. And so in closing, I just want to share that what this program to me means is, is ability to show people all the ways systemic racism is ingrained in people's personality and don't even know it cause that's how they're raised. As, as a white person, a, a, not a person of minority, but if you've never known the system, systemic racism and that you being a part of it, that's what this program shows out all the ways systemic racism is a part of a person's personality without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's so important to educate, especially when it goes to the, into the schools, young people are ready to talk about stuff. And I remember when I did the anti-violence program years ago, mm -hmm. when you open the topic, they'll automatically open up things they've experienced as young people and you at the same time teaching them what they've been feeling the whole time they haven't even known what it is they're feeling but this show is showing how this is all the ways it looks like thank, thank you. you grant hall <laughs> i'm honored to be grant here guys. Hall, thank, thank you. you so much and mr wangye leonard i can't wait for you because you're gonna you're gonna take the baton over the finish line for us in just a couple of minutes <laughs> You were born in Dallas, Texas, Grant, right? I was, My yes. goodness, yes, when I saw that, that's where my father and his family are from. Oh, really? And then you spent a large part of your life in Ohio, right? I did. <laughs> so um, we bounced around a lot, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. we, I was born in Dallas. Then we moved to Arizona. Then we moved to Atlanta. Then we moved to Ohio. Um, my parents had different jobs. My dad was a professional athlete, so there was just constant moving, constant <laughs> shifting constant changing schools. My life was just a constant flux, you know. So when you reflect on that, at what point in your life mm -hmm. did you realize that there was racism active in your growing up, in your maturing into a young man? And how did that impact you? I think I realized it pretty early on. Um, I think it hit me the hardest when I was younger and I didn't quite understand it. Um, I always thought it was weird because I grew up in uh, a predominantly white setting. Um, so I realized that when I would sit on the bus and, you know, maybe a white kid didn't want to sit next to me or, you know, I didn't, I didn't have, you know, I tried to be friends with somebody and they didn't want to be my friend because of my skin color. Uh, I, I played hockey when I was younger because my brother played, my older brother, and that's a predominantly white sport. And, you know, people yeah. call us the N-word at the games. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of stuff. What drew you to Taj and his story? Honestly, I think, I think Taj feels like an outlier. And I, I know what that feels like. Um, not even just growing up African-American. I'm also growing up, I'm also... Um, white as well you know I'm, I'm a I was a group of mixed kid and uh, a lot of times it's very hard to kind of fit in because you're not black enough for the black crowd you're not white yeah. enough for the white crowd you're just kind of in the middle and you're like who am I you know yes um, so I know what it feels like to be an outlier and to kind of not um, to struggle with finding your place in society and, and figuring out who you are how do you feel you and Taj are similar other than what you've just shared with us, is there any other way in which you, you really 
like bonded with this character, not only as you were preparing for it, but as you moved through the production of the web series? It made me think about, um, I always find that uh, the characters you get chosen to play are, um, they say something about who you are and your experiences. And I, I thought about, it, I was like, man, I really haven't, have I really been through that much, you know, racist um, situations in my life? And then the more I thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I really have. I, I remember plenty of times in, in school, my mom would have to go to speak with the principals and the superintendents because kids were, you know, calling us the N-word and teachers weren't treating us fairly and, and just all kinds of problems and just growing up in this place where, you know, you didn't feel comfortable all the time and you, and you just learned. I think I adapted so much to racism that I just became mm -hmm. numb to it. And ah, I just, yes. I didn't even see it the same. I didn't even, I would see racism or people would be racist towards me and I would just ex it because I was so numb, mm -hmm. you know, since I was a little kid. And it made being, jumping into the character of Taj made me uh, dissect my upbringing and actually recall those situations that I've been in. So it, it almost made me discover myself more. Would you say that um, uh, bringing the character of Taj to life was um, in any way a healing process for you? 100%, 100% a healing process. I think anytime you, you play a character that's facing a lot of demons, I think it, it almost makes you, it's almost therapeutic in a way because you're releasing your demons out with them. Yes. It, it's a joint healing. And hopefully it's, it's a, a three-way healing for the audience as well. Thank you so much, Grant. Very well, well stated. And I think right now what I'd like to do is bring in to join you in this discussion. Um, you writer and cre creator and director of Taj the Web Series. This is a gentleman who is a very, very um, prolific writer. He's an award-winning writer producer. He has produced um, um, Where Are the Fathers, The Killing of an Actor, his project um, Possession is coming up very soon this year. And he is also one of the co-creators and he is the producer of the Equality International Film Festival that when it comes around this fall and it becomes available, please, please, please don't miss it. I encourage our viewers to connect to it and to share it because it is an amazing, amazing production that brings submissions from all over the world. So I want to introduce you to Mr. Wanye Leonard. How are you, Wanye? You here with us? Hello there. Hello there. Hello. Hi there. Praise the Lord, Hi there. everybody. Yes. Praise, Praise him Lord, first and everybody. always, right? Praise ye the Lord, everybody. Well, first of all, I want to thank you and Fitz, who are not only wonderful, but what the audience need to know, what everybody need to know. You guys are like spiritual grandparents to me. I have called you and Fitz for counsel on a number of different things, from the leak in my floor to life decisions. And not only have you guys been there for yeah. me, but you guys have counseled, but most importantly, you guys have had fervent prayer. We know from the Bible that the fervent prayer is what availeth much, and you guys have availed much to me and my spirit because of what you have meant to me outside of the inter entertainment industry. And so I thank you so, so much for that. And I also want to say um, that before I get into that, um, what propelled me to do Taj, um, you know, you know you are in good company when you have such mighty men and women of God in your corner. God lets us know each and every day that when his saints get together, we have a mighty good time. And sometimes yes, the do. saints get on each other's nerves when we get together too. <laughs> um, but I have been extraordinarily blessed um, to work with people like Tawana, Armstrong, Herman Johnson, and Donna Trumbo. Um, just a little bit about each of them and, and my observations of them. When I first met Donna Trumbo six years ago, I remember doing the Christmas play at the church that we were both from, Boss. And I went to Donna, and I don't know if Donna remembered this, and I said, I need more mics. And at the time, Donna was holding up the whole church and she was dealing with a very conservative financial economy in terms of what to do. And she said, 
I think I can get him. And it was about a day later, she had the mics for me for the play that we did. And what I know about Donna is she's always the person that's gonna find a way. And so it's, it's just been wonderful to work with her in this capacity. Um, I met Tawana along the way. And the one thing that people need to know about Tawana, she is like a fierce warrior. And she is not only strong in business, but Tawana is a lot like me. When she says it, it is done. And that's it. When, when, Tawana, when Tawana speaks, it is done. It's the same like me. So I, I found a lot of her in myself, a loving, compassionate person. And Herman, I, I call Herman the go-getter, the provider. If we ask Herman, we need, Herman can get. And so when you have three people like that, that are so resourceful and so dynamic, but most importantly are such strong and mighty men and women of God, it's impossible not to be successful. And then of course we have, I call him my own child, Grant Hall. And you know, I've said to so many people, if I had a son, it would resemble Grant Hall. I called him at the last minute when the uh, previous lead um, decided that he was gonna take a different assignment. And we, we didn't fear and we had no malice, but we needed to move on to someone else. And God kept saying to me, call Grant Hall. And I said, no, I don't want to call Grant Hall because he can, he can act up. And, you know, I, don't know, I don't know if I want to call him. He'll act up. And something just kept saying, call Grant Hall. So I called him. And I'm thinking, if Grant answers the phone, then it was meant to be. And I went away from the phone to go back on set and came back. And I got a message from Grant. I called you as soon as I can. And I said, oh, there you go. And I said to Grant on the phone, when you come down here, you cannot disappoint me. You've got to bring it the way that I know you can. And he has exceeded all of our expectations. I love, when I tell you I love him, I just love everything about him. Um, I am praying for him when I talk to him. I'm praying for him when I'm not talking to him. And you're going to find that the whole world is going to find that not only is he an extraordinary actor, but we see his compassion for people and his compassion for serving God through the role. So it's just undeniable. And it's almost providential, providential that he is a part of this project. So Wanya, you are very passionate about the stories you tell in Taj. How much of what is in these stories is based on your life experience? Um, someone once asked me um, in the past couple of weeks, are there things in Taj that you identify with? And when I reflect on it, I said, every bit of this particular conversation is reflective of myself and what I've gone through. I've gone through the discrimination of credit. I've had people perceive a sexuality about me that wasn't and isn't necessarily the case and made assumptions. I've been shut out as an entertainment executive and I actually have three degrees, none of which are even in entertainment. Even in the group that we're on now, sometimes I feel like they've made assumptions about me and I own three businesses. I've been shut out as it relates to, and, and everybody on some degree wanted to do something to their parents. Maybe not what Taj did, but they want to do something to their parents. Everybody's been oppressed. And the mm -hmm. problem is we don't have a lot of idioms in the media to really express and postulate a courageous conversation. So what I love about ABC Equity is that it's in alignment with the type of work that God called me to do. And we have joining us, this is such a great surprise. We have joining us also, Danita McManus. She is the set manager for Wanye Leonard Productions. She's worked with Wanye for many, many years on some excellent, excellent projects as the clutch person. The person that you go to when you're in the clutches and you desperately need an answer and you just don't know where to look and it's, she knows how to solve it and settle it for you. <sighs> I make everybody kind of exhale. So we're gonna chat with her for a few minutes about how she came to work with Wanye and just her thoughts and feelings about the temperature of things right now as Taj is about to premiere in just a few weeks. Hi, welcome, Danita. It's good to see Hi. you. Hi, great. It's good to see you too. Thanks Thank for Thank you me. for taking time out of your very busy day to kind of rush from where you were, come over here, spend a few minutes with us, and then go right back. I wanted to ask you, when you met Wanyi, and what was the first project that you ever worked on with him? 
Okay, so I met Wanye about six years ago, and uh, it was when he was scouting for a project called Where Are the Fathers? And oh, we yes. met for a mutual friend uh, who was looking for an actor for it. My husband was uh, one of the people that she thought of. So uh, Mike actually met Wanye first, uh, came home, told me about his experience with him. I met him about a week later, and we clicked and gelled so well. I feel like I've known him my whole life. We're like brother and sister now, and it's just been smooth sailing ever since. What would you say is the most unique thing about Wanye's directing style? Uh, well, certainly his style. I, it's like nothing I've ever seen. Um, I, I've been on a couple of sets. Um, like I said, Mike uh, has, he, my husband has been in acting for a little while. I actually did some myself through a church theater group. So I've seen direction being given to people, but never like this before. He is absolutely incredible. Um, in being his friend and seeing that side and when he changes hats into the director, it's just, it's it, it's complete flip. You know, he gets in there and he's so focused and he only focuses on the actors. You know, there's nothing else. And that's why like, I feel like my role is so important because I have to make sure everything else is going while he's doing what he needs to do. You know, but he, he the way he teaches and the things that he pulls out of these actors is just absolutely phenomenal and I mean there have been actors that have come in and have been turned off by you know his style but when they see what he gets out of them at the end they're so grateful and they're always sending emails saying you know how incredible he is and how we didn't know what direction you were going when you said what you said or when you did what you did I mean he's got people singing on set he has people doing exercises, he gets icebreakers going, whatever he can do to get them loosened up and in, you know, ready to go. That's what he does. So it's definitely unorthodox, but it works. It does work. It's masterful. I mean, um, uh, you, you come as an actor and, and sometimes actors think that um, the only job is to learn your lines and show up. <laughs> so much then more. You, 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 it's good to, to know your lines and it's good to know your character. But then when you come to set, you're in the hands of the director. Right. Because he's the one that brings the vision to life. And we are the tools that right. help to make that happen. And so sometimes it's like, well, why are they doing thus and so? Or what do you mean you want me to do that over again? But right. as the process goes on with him, mm -hmm. you start to see you know, what, what his method really is. And by Definitely. the time you go to set to shoot it, mm -hmm. you feel comfortable, you feel fortified and you feel safe. Right. In the Definitely. hands of somebody who wants you to bring your best to that camera lens. Would yeah. you say that's the truth? Absolutely. When you think of the story of Taj overall, and I think mm -hmm. it's, it's told in a very, very unique way, but I won't even give a hint as to what mm -hmm. I mean by that. People will just have to see it when it comes. Um, would you say would you say that there are um, stories in Taj that reflect at all any of your life experience or not with systemic racism or or social justice or challenges like that? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I do have to say yes. Um, I was raised in the military. My dad did thirty years in the Air Force, uh, so that was about a third of my life. Um, that, you know, that I spent traveling and around a bunch of diversity. We lived in Japan twice. I had an incredible uh, journey, you know, being in the military with my, my family. And so um, saying that to say when he retired in 89, I didn't really experience any racism until he got out, he got out of the Air Force. And uh, a couple of those were in high school. I got moved from South Sacramento up to North Sacramento, Citrus Heights area. And um, it was a huge culture shock for my sister and I. We, we were one of maybe four Blacks in the class of 200. So um, huge wake up call. Um, I got called out of my name the first week of school, um, had some stares, had people that just didn't like us because of the color of our skin. So um, that was a bit much. And I had certainly not experienced anything like that before. And then another thing um, I was able to relate to was just the um, prejudice. I'm in an interracial marriage. I have been for over 20 years and um, very happily married. But man, I tell you, we went through some things early on when we were dating. I started dating him at 19. And so we would go to fairs and carnivals and places like that. And just stares and mumbles from people um, was definitely felt. 
you know, but I feel like those kind of things made, made me stronger, made us stronger as a couple too. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. It's, it's nice to know that, that um, you had parents um, raising you who guided you through what could have been a minefield mm -hmm. of, right. um, of a barrage of uh, examples of systematic racism. Um, and my mm -hmm. family was the same. My dad was from the South, but he raised us to be able to navigate through anything we had to in life. Right, um, right. And to know that we had value as people. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of interracial marriages in my family as well. Mm -hmm. And when those things happen and, and my siblings started dating the people that they were dating, his response was, well, that's how I raised you to be. So right. why, why should I have an objection when it happens, I just want you to be right. well. And it sounds like you had the same experience. Absolutely, and those are the things that I want to instill in my children and I do instill in them. They're 12 mm -hmm. and 17 now. So one of them is definitely at an age where he could be dating. Um, the other one, not quite there yet, thankfully. <laughs> but <laughs> Cross your fingers, right? <laughs> yeah, things that I'm gonna be impressing upon them and continue to impress upon them is just knowing their worth and not settling for less. And it's, if it's a person that's outside of their race, still being accepting of it as long as they're being treated well. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your ideas. I appreciate you coming you. in again on your busy day to, to be part of this with us. Um, and we look forward to Taj coming out. I can't wait, can't wait, can't wait. Um, and can't on that either. note, what I will do is, um, I'm going to thank Ms. Danita McManus, set manager for Wanye Productions uh, for joining us this afternoon. We're gonna take a couple of minutes to take a break before we go into our final segment, which is wrap up and final thoughts. I encourage you, our audience, to leave your comments. Click like if you liked anything you heard on this show today. And also subscribe because we will be coming again, not only with more information and more lead ups to the premiere of Taj, but all kinds of straight up no chaser topics that people are discussing out in the world today. And on that note, we will see you back in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And we are in our final segment of Straight Talk. Today, our published topic has been systemic racism and the upcoming web series, Taj. And in our last segment, we were speaking with our writer, creator, director, Mr. Wanye Leonard. And boy, did he have a lot to share with us. He had, oh my goodness, he took us to church on that one. And then lead actor, Grant Hall. Before I go into the next segment, I wanted to share something briefly about my experience. I always, I always share with people when I first meet them and they ask me about certain things and how could this happen and did this really happen? And yeah, I lived through two of the Watts riots and the Rodney King situation and the OJ trial, which is when I first went into radio um, as a profession. And I also saw little prejudices, things that people think that you don't notice even when you're a kid. But as much as my dad who's from Texas tried to hide things from us so that we wouldn't be worried growing up, we saw things happen. We saw how he was treated when we were out and about with him. I remember they used to do uh, very casual um, walks 
with their placard signs through neighborhoods, we shall overcome, the NAACP did it, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality did it, right through neighborhoods in front of people's homes. And I'll never forget the time that my mom went on, on one of those walks without my father. And when she came home, she was hysterically crying. And believe me, that woman didn't cry about anything except childbirth because she was so happy. But she fell to the floor inside of, in front of the front door of our house, panicked my father, scared him to death, and she just wouldn't stop screaming. And he noticed that she kept rubbing her leg. And he says, what's wrong? What's wrong? So when he looked at her leg, he saw there was blood on her pants. And it turned out that as they were walking through one of these neighborhoods, a white gentleman who had a gorgeous German shepherd dog in his front yard thought it would be fun to let the dog out to see what would happen. And the dog bit my mother and she required stitches and she required penicillin and she required all of that stuff. And I was 13 years old at the time. And, and, I, and I carry it with me today because I never could as a kid figure out how somebody thought that was a joke and how they could deliberately, and not like the dog got out accidentally, he let him out and he was standing there with his beer and his cigarette laughing because he thought it was so funny. But in those days we had what they call beat cops, right Herman? And that policeman was on that guy as fast as he could get through the crowd of people and get to him because those policemen patrolled our neighborhoods on foot to make sure that neighbors were safe, to make sure that they could live in peace and to let that gentleman know he was wrong. And as they called it in the old days, the paddy wagon was coming to get him. So I just wanted to share that with everyone because I, that's was, that was when I knew that I may not be safe in Los Angeles, California, where people don't think things happen like other places. I wanna to segue to, to what Monye was sharing before about how he directs and what it's like to be on one of his projects because both Fitz Houston and I are in the cast along with Grant Hall of Taj. And I have to tell you, I had waited a long time but it was my first experience working with Wanye Leonard, with him as my director. It was a totally different experience than any other director that I have had. And I have to tell you, it was a masterclass in acting, in delivering a mission-driven story. It was transformative, not only in my career, but in my life. And just how I see certain things a different way. And so I want to thank him for including me in this project. I will not be the same as a person or as an actor moving forward. He has really set the standard for directors with me. And I, I, I just wish everyone who's involved in this project the best because I know we're going to touch people. I know we're gonna open people's minds and not only the people that we feel need to hear the message, but our people as well, because there's some of us that really need to hear the message as well. So on that note, I wanted to ask you, Grant, what kind of impact do you hope that this film will have on our country and on the world? Because it will be seen international, I believe that. Mm. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for sharing that story. That was very, very powerful and very moving. Um, but to answer your question, I, I really hope that it, uh, it opens people's eyes up to racism. Uh, I feel like this film is a very accurately escalated view of racism and what happens on a daily basis, whether it be at schools, at jobs, um, you know, any place. Uh, I just hope that it opens people's eyes up and it, it gives them more of an education, so to say, on, uh, on what a lot of people of like us, people of color experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Tawana, what final thoughts do you have? Well, John, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Thank you for everyone today sharing your stories and uh, being a part of Taj. We so appreciate 
um, the support um, that you guys bring to the table. You now, my final thoughts with respect to Taj are, um, given the pandemic, I, I look at this as an opportunity. The world uh, came to almost a standstill so that we could mm -hmm. begin to see one another. Yes. Things unfortunately had to happen in order for us to begin to acknowledge our experiences and our journeys um, and to begin to know that we are one. We are one with humanity. So I tell everybody, I am bound and determined. I'm bound by the commission to make sure that I love him, her, as much as I love myself. I, and I'm bound to make sure I am bound by the commission that uh, I love my neighbors as myself. Uh, I am determined to do the will of her. I am determined to get my crown. I am bound and determined to make a difference. This is my yeah. opportunity to do just that. Um, given that the world uh, was almost stopped so that I could step into uh, what she has said, you wouldn't listen to me. Now you guys need to get out and do the work. I am bound and determined to do the work. Thank you so much, Joanna. It was great to have you here. Thank you. What about you, Donna? Well, okay, I might get a little teary-eyed and it's not because I'm sad. I'm so passionate about the work that we all do together. And it is no accident that the seven of us have come together. I thank God for that because there's a reason why he needed us to do his mighty work. I do believe that this breaking down of systemic racism that's the hope of the world. That's gonna bring the solidarity that we need. And so I have to do an amazing shout out to Wanya Leonard, my personal friend, my director, creator, writer, producer of all of this, because without him sitting in my kitchen table and talking about a dream, we wouldn't have one. And it is with that shared dream, like we had with Dr. Martin Luther King, that dream that with our mixed talents, and mixed gifts. We networked with other people to carry with their gifts and talents and came together for some mighty work to be done in this community. So without him, we wouldn't have these, this movie. Without Tawana and Herman, I wouldn't have the blessed partners that I have to forge ahead courageously. Without you fellow actors, Jana and, and, and Fitz Houston, Grant, and the other actors and the crew, none of this could have happened. So it is a God thing and it is no accident. And now we are able to carry it forward. And I want to thank everybody. And I just want to challenge all these people who are listening to this podcast. Will you please join us in solidarity? Help us to take a stand to help others understand that the only way that we can break down systemic racism is to do it together. Thank you very much, Donna. Mr. Herman, what say you? Um, again, thank you, everybody, for being on the call. And this has been amazing. Um, my final thoughts are, I think we all need to find our fight. Um, find your battle. Find your voice. Find where you fit in. Um, my, my objective for all of us is we can make a small difference with just one person. And if each person do the same, um, we can make a big difference in the world. Um, one of the things that I say that I, I think Taj was going to do is help everyone open up discussion. We need to have dialogue. We need to be able to talk and ask questions that make us uncomfortable. We need to be okay with asking questions that we're uncomfortable with. I, I think a lot of times we just don't say something because of the, the fear of what the other person might think or how I may come across. Or if I say that, then you might think I'm a racist because I didn't know I was not supposed to ask to touch your hair. You know, things like that, right? There, there's so we just keep it inside and what it does, it just creates division. And I think we need to be able to have dialogue and what Taj is gonna do, and what I hope people can take away from this as my final thought is be willing to have conversation with one another, be willing to talk and, and let's just, let's put aside our differences and let's have one voice, let's unite, let's talk, let's come together. Thank you so much, Herman. I'd like to interject that my excitement about Taj is the potential of discussion that can take place. We've heard throughout the program about there's a need for conversation. And that's true. Because if there's no conversation, there can be no understanding. And if there's no understanding, there can be no healing. So they have to be together. And when someone is in denial about even thinking it exists, then there can be no understanding or healing. So I remember when I taught school, 
I was a substitute teacher in many, many schools, and I saw many variations of racism in schools and bigotry between different groups, Blacks versus Armenian, Armenian versus Hispanic, Hispanic versus Blacks, Blacks against whites, all the different variations of racial conflict in the schools. And when you have a project that is bringing up systemic racism and how the behavior can be embedded into people's behavior, then that allows discussion to take place. And when you have the discussion and can understand the tension and what's going on and how to fix it, then healing can begin. That's what is so important about having a discussion or a great conversation as we've heard throughout this project. And that's why I'm so excited as being a former teacher and a substitute teacher as an actor in many schools, I saw this. And as soon as I heard about this being a focus, one of the focuses being in schools, that really got me excited because young people are waiting to talk about what's going on in the world and how it affects them. And outside of schools, the very same thing. A lot of people are in denial and they need to talk about it, understand it, so we can heal. Mr. Wanye Leonard, what would you like to close this out with? Oh goodness, I get to close. I wanna say that if you guys um, have been listening to all of the people that come before me, including Fitz and Jana, if you are like me, you have been lifted already. I say you have been lifted already. For me in my personal life, I've said it a bazillion times and I mean it a bazillion and one. I exist to be service as unto God. And as the old church hymn would say, build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. And as the old folks would also say, the old saints, that is, because I don't think they want me to call them old folks. They would say, don't you be caught with your works undone. And I want for myself and for everyone else to understand that for as long as there are racial ills, for as long as there is systemic racism, for as long as there is isolation and oppression, we have a lot of work to do. And I think that Taj not only exposes the systemic racism that has unfortunately become the tragic dichotomy of our society, but it also examines avenues of hope and forgiveness. This series is about hope and forgiveness. And it is also about the substratum of ABC Equity Consultants, a courageous conversation. And in that, I would say to all of your viewers, you are welcomed in this space. Your concerns yes. are welcomed as you watch this. Your hopes are welcomed as you watch this. Your brainstorming of solutions in your homes are welcomed as you watch this, and therefore you are welcomed in this space. And as you're in this space, if you like what you hear, and if you like what you see, the best way that you can contribute in terms of making a difference is to watch it, to spread this interview and start the preliminary courageous conversation and allow Taj to take it from there and then you do some work from there. We ask that you not only watch this interview, we ask that you support the series in any possible way that you can, because the only way we're going to be lifted up is if everyone lifts it up. So we invite you into this space. We thank you. We bless you. We empower your homes and we empower your courageous conversations. And we hope that Taj can serve as a very instrumental tool in doing so. We welcome you into this space. Thank you so much, Wanye. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. This has been Straight Talk with Jonna Houston. I want to thank every single guest that we've had on our panel today. Thank you, Donna Trumbo. Thank you, Tuana Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Herman Johnson. Thank you, the fabulous Grant Hall. And thank you, our master of communication through storytelling, Mr. Wanye Leonard. Be on the lookout for this interview and be on the lookout for Taj, which has its final shooting weekend this weekend. And then in a few weeks, it will be ready to launch so that you can share in the experience of Taj 
the web series. May you have a blessed and beautiful day, and we'll see you again next time.